Hello, everyone. Thank you very much uh, to our hosts, and uh, welcome to all of you. A uh, funny story, actually. When we were told that we're going to be uh, doing the breakout session, I didn't envision such a great stage, so it feels like I was doing another gala or something. Um, but anyway, we're here today to talk a little bit about digital um, journey, the revolution um, that is here. Um, but first for the introduction. So my name is Karolina Adamczyk. Um, I've got over 13 years of experience within um, finance and automation. 11 of those years I actually spent with HP. Uh, I also um, am an expert within the intelligent automation area and hold a master's degree in finance management. So I'm Meredith Trebinska. So I've been with HP for 18 years, um, most of it uh, within internal audit, risk, and compliance. So that's my background. Um, I joined the team about three years ago uh, when we were initially starting this program. So uh, I have an MBA. I'm from the US, and I'm uh, excited to be here. Thank you. All right, and don't forget that this is the use case. I know the room is quite big, but um, I'm sure that I can hear all of your questions uh, when you decide to shout them out. Uh, we'll try to accommodate for Q&A at the end, but if not, uh, then please, uh, you know, just reach out to us. Uh, we're here all day, and then obviously uh, through LinkedIn we can keep in touch. Okay, so let's see if I know how to operate this little device, yes. Um, so we like to open all of our speeches with uh, this Luke Williams quote, which is to compete today, business leaders need a revolution in thinking, a steady stream of disruptive strategies and an expected solution to stay ahead of the game. And this is so true at the moment. You know, the, uh, we're at the midst of um, a fourth industrial revolution. Things are picking up. Um, you know, if you're not competitive, if you're not disruptive, you're just risking um, being left um, behind. So what we're here today to do is to show you how our journey started, where it got us, and really what it took to get here. Um, quick look at the agenda. So this is what you're going to see, so this is what to expect. Uh, we want to share a little bit about uh, HP, so you know, I mean, post-split, uh, I know that there is a lot of confusion still on the market, which HP are we? Um, we will uh, talk about the finance innovation journey, then I want to present to you a business case, so something more um, that, so you can see that you can touch, you can feel on your, for yourself. This is one of our early implementations that we did on cash applications. We will go into the innovation ecosystem, which is something that we've adapted to make sure um, that we have got a nice control and nice monitoring and um, robust governance around it. And then we will go into the lessons learned, which I think is something that you're most interested in. Um, and I'm expecting a lot of questions over there. So I'll hand it over to Meredith to talk a little bit about that. Okay. Great. Thanks, Carolina. Okay, so a little bit about HP Inc. Um, so HP is actually a very old company from the Silicon Valley. It was established in 1939. Uh, but about four years ago, the company split into two companies, HPE and HPI. So HPI is where we're from. It's the printing. It's the computing side of the house. Um, with that separation, uh, really, the culture changed. Uh, the need for innovation, the need to do things differently, to stay competitive in the market is really the driving force within the company. So with that, at the time, the corporate controller for finance uh, you know, really established this mindset for emerging technologies, um, delving into the area of robotics as the initial start. Um, so with that, uh, we formulated this Finance Innovation Office. So just a few facts about HP Inc. for you up there so you can get familiar. Um, but really, the, the, the vision of this company is keep reinventing at every level. Um, Dion, our CEO, he talks about, you know, people look to us to innovate within our products. But he also says we need to be innovating in all areas of the company and especially within finance. Okay, so an introduction to our finance automation program. 
Um, so to date, we have over 300 robots in production. These are blended automations, um, a bit of desktop automation with pure software robotics. Um, some of the kind of the key points to show you is that we have automated within the accounts payable space, the accounts receivable space, really all of those back office uh, transaction type operations. Um, with, with that, we have about 250 projects that we have automated. Now, these are medium to complex. We're really talking about end-to-end -end process automations using software. Um, Post-separation, um, and we'll talk a little bit about that, is we're, we're using two different technologies. We're using a Cryon systems, and then we're also using UiPath as our main automation tool. So with this, this journey of three years of uh, doing automation, we've, we've achieved about a 10% workforce efficiency. Um, if you think about at the separation, we were a, f a Fortune 50 company, and we split into two Fortune 100 companies. But the employee base that went to HP Inc. was a fourth of the size. So if you think about the fourth of the employees managing an infrastructure that was uh, the same uh, pre-separation. So very cumbersome infrastructure processes with a smaller uh, employee base. So we really needed to find efficiencies in our processes. We needed to really modify our business operating models to support uh, in the long run. All right, so I think on that, the other thing that we have been doing, we, you know, our initial piece was looking at RPA, pure RPA on the very manual and transaction-based activities. Um, but we're also delving into virtual assistants, uh, natural language processing, and process mining. So we'll talk a little bit about that later. Okay, so if we talk about the innovation journey, this, this slide is really representing the, the strategy here. Um, because each of these four pillars are really essential to uh, an, an automation journey. Um, you have to think about process optimization. So I think HP was doing that really well post-separation, is we had teams looking from a, a total uh, vertical, from a process end-to-end, -end, like quote to cash or procure to pay, and looking at globalization, standardization, um, process harmonization, uh, to then optimize it for automation. And then with that, we moved into the robotics to then automate those very standard um, and voluminous type of activities. Um, so again, we're looking at optimizing within our RPA space with standardization of scripts so that they're, they're leverageable across the organization um, in order to reduce those manual efforts. And then within this, we wanted to move into more of the integrated analytics, more into the predictive and prescriptive. Um, it wasn't uh, enough to just do historical reporting. So if you think about your typical finance activities of business reporting, is typically historical. You do a look back and you're reporting on how, how the performance was. Now we really need to look at a longer horizon forward. We need to understand what are our key drivers um, and see if we can make um, better decisions and influence uh, the future. So more into the predictive and prescriptives. Um, so we have a data analytics team. I would say it's probably even bigger than our robotics team. Data analytics and data science who are really driving this, uh, this space. And then obviously getting into the more of the artificial intelligence. So bringing more intelligence into our automation um, than your kind of standard RPA activities. So that was the strategy that our corporate controllers set for us three years ago. And the next slide is going to talk about that journey. Um, so those early initial days back in 2016 when we established the Robotics Automation Office. Um, so I had the pleasure, as long as Carolina, to join early. We, we were one of the first ones to join this. Um, from a program standpoint, our approach was to drive this globally and centralized. Um, we did establish regional hubs um, in Mexico, Poland, India, and then also in Houston, which is one of our major, um, our site. Our headquarters is in Palo Alto, but Houston is really a significant base in the US. So those are four regional teams um, under the guidance of a central program. 
And I had, a, I had the pleasure of working in that program team from a global perspective, uh, looking at the standardization, looking at our processes, defining an end-to-end -end governance model. So again, with my background in internal audit, looking at process standardization, um, but also looking at not over-engineering the governance model, uh, not wanting to stifle the innovation. Um, so I would say in those early days, we really were driving toward implementation, making our proof points, getting uh, the business or getting finance engaged with the idea of robotics and the idea of automation. Uh, because there's a heavy amount of change management that goes along with uh, implementation. So it really was to get those quick wins, get those um, pilot projects into production, and start convincing the organization uh, that this is really essential for our future. So our corporate controller at the time, again, I mean, she really put a, an aggressive goal for us to achieve. So by December of that fiscal year, 2016, uh, we needed to achieve 50 robots in production. And so different people have different ways of counting robots, but we're purely counting it by the number of um, uh, software bots that were put in production, typically managing um, medium and high complexity. Like I said, accounts payable, accounts receivable. So by that December, we were automating on, on a, a legacy software, um, which was the Cryon system, that we had within the company. And by Q2 of the next fiscal year in 2017, um, we had done an enormous amount of automation in the AP space, and accounts payable space. And we consider that our dark period. Uh, we consider that because things weren't working as, as expected. Bots were failing, and we needed to understand why. So we stopped putting any further bots into production. Uh, we took a look at ourselves from a process standpoint, what we were doing, trying to define some lessons learned. And what we found was that um, because there was such a push to, to make a point to deliver on robots, um, we were moving too fast, and we needed better documentation around um, the processes. We needed better due diligence, I guess, is not trying to bite off more than we can chew. So if you look at accounts payable space, what is really the core process within that AP space, and go after that and automate it. We were looking at so many exceptions to the process and trying to automate that, and then also being blind to other areas where um, there were other handling errors um, that we needed to uh, address. And so the, the learning there was better due diligence, understanding of the process, also you know, harmonizing the process across, uh, across the regions to drive um, more effective automation. So going back to those pillars, process um, efficiency, process standardization, and then automating it. With that, we also found that um, we needed a more robust RPA software. And so we went out and did a, um, an RFP looking at the major vendors in the RPA space. So Automation Anywhere, Blue Prism, uh, UiPath. And you know, through the process, uh, with IT, we assessed that for us, UiPath seemed to be the right uh, software for the work that we were doing. And so by um, June of that year, we deployed our first bot on UiPath, so in the accounts receivable space. So it was a global cash application process. So again, you can see on the, on the slide, you know, the, the couple major milestones of, you know, by August of 2017, we deployed 100 bots. By July of that next year, 200. In the meantime, we explored and deployed our first chat bot. Um, and then by Q1 of this year, we achieved 300 robots. And with that, I mean, struggle at the beginning, um, and then learning from our, our mistakes and deploying further robots, um, now, now we can actually see that we're being recognized in the industry for our program. Uh, so in 2018, Hackett recognized us uh, for smart automation, and, and we've been shortlisted again this year. So really kudos to our team for all of their hard work. All right. So now I think I'll turn it over to Carolina and let her walk you through one of the use cases. 
Okay, so um, what I wanted to do right now is uh, to tell you a little bit about one of our sort of early adoptions, I would say. It's not just RPA. Um, this is a blended uh, technology approach where we actually combine RPA with some NLP components, which is natural language programming. Um, again, early adoption. Um, the go live date was set for October 2017, um, but one of the best because uh, of the scale um, and the rate that we could scale up with it. So let me try to explain uh, the process here. So we're talking about the accounts receivable space. Um, this process actually was 16 years old. It was heavily manual, mundane, labor intensive. We had over, well, or just under 100 people working on it. Um, and this sort of process was achieved throughout a 24 hour shift. So we had people working on it like all the time. Um, as you can see, this is a, uh, one of the finance processes that really has got the financial impact. Uh, first of all, on our cash position, but also on the credit um, stand and unlocking credits for our vendors. And opportunities here, um, I mean, you can see for yourself, it was 48 countries. We had to download 100, um, um, or, like on endless um, bank statements from over 100 bank accounts. We're talking about 39 billion um, cash that was applied every year and 1.2 million payments along with 8.5 million invoices that would come in on a daily basis. And this process um, was involving, like I just mentioned, just downloading the statements, um, offsetting, uh, recording payment to general ledger, and then offsetting invoice to the payment so that we don't call the same invoices to the vendors twice or, or many times. Um, one of those, um, well, I, I wouldn't say issues, but the challenges that we had with this process is that we were working with a lot of unstructured data. So whereas when you download the statement from the bank account, it can come in a different format, you know? Um, we had to write many scripts to kind of deal with that. Uh, then we had to, um, ha we have about 50 working bots at the moment, uh, or 35 working bots that are logging into 50 um, general, generic mailboxes in search for remittances from vendor accounts. So basically those bots um, are going into data exchange server, they're looking for emails, they're trying to identify it and structure it as much as they can because those formats of remittances come in many, many different formats. And we're talking about TXT, CSVs, uh, PDFs, just simple notes, you name it. Um, and that was also one of the challenges that we um, had this uh, bar set up of 100% of compliance and accuracy that had to be achieved on that process. So currently, if we talk about the benefits, we have with our um, NLP component, which was scripted in our language, um, that I can uh, talk to you about in, in case anyone's interested in details, uh, we can have a chat about it later on. But the benefits uh, conclude 100% of accuracy right now. So we went uh, from 99.2 accuracy, which was achieved by um, the humans, to 100% of accuracy. And that simply translates in terms of the dollar value to 31 million of error avoidance um, in cash that is applied. We have been able to automate around 91% of what we have received as an input, which is um, quite a high rate considering the process and considering how old it is. Um, and also considering our challenges, which also involved structuring the process and streamline it, and then getting credit and collection folks to sort of work with us and support this automation. Um, we have also been able to redeploy 30% of FTEs, which translates to around about 23 um, people to the value add activities, which is uh, the analyzing the, uh, the position, the cash position, analyzing the vendor credits, etc. Overall, we're just making a better business uh, in that space, in that area. And also, we're talking about six times faster processing. So what is something has taken um, over 40 hours, now it takes six hours. Um, or eight hours. 
And not only that, we're able to scale up. And also, um, if you can imagine, we have got no backlog at the moment because we have got so many bots now working in case volume comes up. We just simply redeploy uh, another bots to handle that volume, which is which becomes very handy, specifically during the month and close area or um, quarter and close or year and close. Uh, if you work in finance, you you know exactly what I'm uh, talking about. So um, with this, what I wanted to um, show you is the little demo um, that will hopefully summarize what we've just uh, touched upon here. Uh, and then we come back to um, the sort of aftermath of the process. With keeping the finance controllership vision in mind, we strive to be the best digital controllership on the planet. We at HP have automated the cash application process as part of the accounts receivable function which has significantly reduced the amount of manual effort and improved the experience of the customers and internal stakeholders who play an integral role in HP's success. By exploring RPA, we moved away from the traditional approach of manual processing and have now embraced intelligent automation to perform cash application from bank statement downloading to booking cash at the customer level. With the introduction of natural language processing capability, the robot is also able to read emails from mailboxes, identify the invoice and payment details, and match those values and offset invoices on the SAP ERP screen. By implementing robotics, we realise the value proposition of robotics is not limited to just process efficiencies. It has other benefits such as operational efficiency, real-time data availability, digital data management, and reduced dependency on people, to name a few. Data and business insights that come with it are the real key drivers in the automation journey for innovation. Our robots can now deliver information to the business to help make decisions at the snap of a finger. Our innovation journey has helped finance controllership to effectively automate more tasks, streamline processes, increase employee productivity and ultimately deliver more satisfying customer experiences. So I guess one thing to say here as well is that this automation or improvement goes beyond technology and what kind of you know, fancy stuff we can achieve with a bit of a code. Um, we're actually getting a lot of uh, good feedback from the customers and you would think uh, what happened to all those people, 23 almost people uh, that we sort of redeployed to better tasks, they're actually very, very happy. Um, our last year's survey, which is the VIA, we call it here at HP, shows almost a 10% of increase in terms of employee engagement, who are very proud to be, um, you know, the part of this journey, the part of the future, and they also see that we are um, heavily investing into, um, you know, upskilling them and, you know, just preparing them for the, for the tasks that are awaiting them in the future. Um, in terms of the... Um, what are the what are the what is the operating model after the RP specifically just based on that uh, uh, implementation? So we've been able to merge and get and put closer people with technology, whereas we used to have um, people doing the um, mundane tasks. Now we have the bots, and we also do have people who are. Um, monitoring those bots, uh, right? This is one of the benefits as well um, of that specific RPA that we have now got uh, Kibana dashboards that we can look around, look, look and into and see exactly where the process is going, where are we stuck, um, etc. cetera. So um, I think with that, I will hand over to Meredith for a bit of a, a backstory into the ecosystem and then we can move on. Okay. Yeah. All right, if we can go to the next slide. Okay. okay. Okay, so this is the finance innovation ecosystem. Um, so this slide, really the, the, the point of this slide is that there's a lot of different components involved in um, starting a, a intelligent automation program. Um, 
you know, the first being a robust governance. So as I mentioned earlier, we decided to do this centralized. Um, we decided to use um, the help of Lean Six Sigma to define um, the software development lifecycle. Um, we have a documentation repository where, you know, from a knowledge guide or a knowledge management standpoint is essential for not only ensuring that we have standardization or standard practices on uh, developing our robots, but that also from a business continuity standpoint, we have those um, documents available. Because obviously, as you are automating, um, you also are repurposing your, your employees to other work, um, finding them other value add activities to do, and that knowledge can get lost. Um, so with that, I mean, I think in the early stages, we were trying to make the proof points, and, I, and, and later, and I'll talk about it in the next slide, is looking end to end at, you know, from a risk management standpoint, um, the, 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 the new risks that emerging technologies bring into a company. Uh, funnel management, uh, one of the changes that initially it was to make the, the proof of concepts um, with very little attention to potentially the ROI. Um, now it's really essential that you know, the projects are bringing a positive ROI. We're, we're really scrutinizing that now as to where we want to invest in future automations. Um, in some cases with our more of our advanced intelligent automations, that's more difficult to quantify um, because there's additional business value creation that is, is coming there. It's not just an efficiency play anymore with a, like a pure RPA, but with an intelligent automation, um, there's other value creation. Um, for example, we're looking at cash forecasting. We're looking at increasing our cash forecasting to a six month cycle. Uh, versus, you know, one to two months that it had previously been. Well, that's hard to quantify what that value will be um, in doing that automation. Technology and infrastructure, um, from a global program management standpoint, one of the things that we've looked at is, or, or have managed, is the relationship with cybersecurity, with our IT colleagues, um, with our compliance organizations, so internal audit. Um, and I, that's one of our, you know, lessons learned or recommendations is that you have a strong partnership. We decided early on that we uh, wanted to co-partner with IT on this innovation journey. Um, so they were working with us, um, ensuring that the automations that we were doing, that the controls that we built in moving a bot into production were following standard um, IT control practices. And then also with cybersecurity, working with them on uh, digital IDs or bot IDs um, has been something that we've been working on for the past uh, year and are still in the process of implementing. So that, those relationships are really critical to establish. Um, and I think also with that centralized governance model, the, the standardization or the process documentation and practices that we've established and engaging with audit and these different organizations has brought a very robust governance. Um, quality and control, I mentioned our, our Lean Six Sigma team um, because we found that in some cases, um, you know, it, it, it required some process optimization prior to automation. Um, and now we're actually even moving into a space where uh, we're implementing S4 HANA and there are certain functionalities that don't exist that we need to automate. So also needing the support of those teams uh, to help us define what that process would be in the new environment and then automating that. Then the next part that's equally as important as your relationship with these different organizations um, and the technology that you use and the process that you define is also people and the, the shift in culture and that management of change process. Um, Part of our job not only um, has been to build code, but it's also to build sort of that marketing and um, uh, communication within the finance organization and even beyond to get people on board with this, this change, right? That it's not, um, it's not something to be scared of, but that it's actually something that's going to improve uh, the work that we do. Um, and Carolina is going to talk a little bit more about that, about what we've done at a more local level within Poland. Um, but we have that as part of the ecosystem that management of change is really um, a, key, a key point to this overall ecosystem. 
So I'm going to move on to the next slide. And, and this is the risk framework. Um, I won't talk about it too much, but again, because my background in internal audit and risk management, um, this is something that we looked at last year. That we finally said we need to look end to end um, what are the risks related to emerging technologies, whether it's a chatbot, um, an algorithm that a data scientist builds, or a, a, or a robot that's implemented. We need to understand the risk universe. We need to understand the end to end risk environment, even what it is today and potentially what it will be in the future, so that we are prepared and we're already thinking about um, what type of governance or control we'll need. Um, so this pinwheel is basically just showing the, the three areas, strategy, delivery, and operations. And then you go down multiple levels to then really articulate the risks and the controls that you need. Um, if you think about you know, acquiring a software uh, to be brought in-house and start working, well, you need to think about certain controls from a procurement standpoint, from you know, screening the vendor to having cybersecurity assess the, the, the software, do a pin test of it. Um, through to, you know, how do you move code into production? Is that code, um, is that code clean? Um, is it built according to the specifications of the business? So these are all the controls you need to think about, and this is something that we went through this exercise last year to really um, define it. Um, and that, I, I would say, was also um, a key learning is that we really needed to do more in our business continuity planning. So last year, we really kick-started off um, the whole BCP for those automations that we had deployed. Where are our critical processes? Where have those people um, are no longer there? Um, and how would we react if there was an incident? Um, and so we actually... we. we had a, a live incident uh, where our bots went down because the underlying applications failed. Uh, and so then, you know, we had to go back, get those people that used to do the work, were they trained, do they understand how to perform the job, um, and get them in place. Uh, so that's something that we've been working on only just last year. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Carolina to talk about more from a people standpoint. Thank you. So let's focus on the soft side of the business uh, for a little bit here, and uh, let's uh, look at the impacts of disruption, the, of disruption, and specifically how is inverting the labor pyramid. Now, um, currently um, versus future state, you see that the, the best or the biggest impact is uh, lies with functional and transactional, as well as data normalization um, capabilities, right? I mean, we see that already, and this actually ties uh, very nicely to the cash applications process that I showed you uh, just earlier uh, before. We are putting more emphasis into the inside delivery, and as Meredith mentioned, our analytics team actually is bigger than, than the RPA team by about 25%. Um, the capabilities uh, lies within the two teams, actually, so we're operating in a blended uh, reality here. But um, in terms of what to expect, we're expecting this further um, reduction in the workforce in terms of the transactional. So definitely we need to focus on those people who are at the moment taking part in all of those implementations and projects. So they are not, so they are great supporters actually, and we have done a lot of um, um, stuff around, I would say, communicating, um, getting people on board as well, and just, you know, trying to get them excited about what's to come. So in terms of, again, practical terms, I can speak from the um, Polish market, from Polish uh, hub in Wrocław. Uh, in 2000, 15, so just right after the split, we have started uh, in the organization, which is finance controllership operations, we have started with about 200 people um, three and a half years ago, um, uh, sorry, four years later, we are about 155, I believe. So we basically went down in heads by 25%. Uh, meanwhile, we've been able to um, maintain the level of support and actually uh, increase the level of support with RPA because we've accommodated for about 40% of invoice increase in volume, um, around 21% in VAT, VAT registration management, and the audits. I believe that this organization is audited uh, quite uh, a lot. In fact, 
since this split, we've, we, we, we've undergone um, around 80 um, audits just within the VAT space, which is a little tiny part of our processes. And um, so far, all of them have been closed positively. I mean, the good thing as well is that all of that, um, I would say all of that uh, um, benefits are being reinvested, right? So I can just quickly um, show you there in the practical terms as well. While we're changing the processes, we also need the behaviors to change. So that was something that was like um, sort of standing um, before us um, as a goal to achieve. We have to have people who understand the data. We have to have people who have got the business knowledge as well. So we invest heavily in that as well. We have them to be flexible, agile, um, immune to change, actually very happy to change and change very quickly and have them have the customers in the center of their heart, uh, so to speak. So going over to the in practical terms uh, of what we did, I've just pulled here a couple of the resources that are available just in Wrocław Hub because I want to speak to you uh, from the practical point of view. We can basically categorize them into the face-to-face -face, um, uh, resources and online resources as well for those who cannot attend or work remotely. So we have got a lot of uh, trainings that we um, offer face-to-face um, -face through the Skills Champions platform. This is the platform where people, our employees, experts in certain areas, come together, create content, and deliver face-to-face -face sessions for free for our employees, which, again, that doesn't uh, cost us much and actually translates into the cost avoidance in terms of uh, third-party engagement. So we've got technical trainings. Uh, most of those trainings are being delivered by my team, but not only that. We have got soft skills, so presentation skills, empathy, um, everything that revolves around design thinking and uh, creativity as well. What we also have done, we have heavily invested in um, race and MA uh, certifications, so they can actually now get certified in certain areas like robotics, which is race, robotics automation certification. We've revamped it uh, a little bit uh, in the last year or so. We're also offering the, the coding um, academy here. MAs, which is an analytics training, um, something that um, is being delivered out of our um, analytics team as well, uh, which enables people around statistical methods, around BI tools, and everything um, that goes into having the insight into the you know, business, how it is uh, at a snap of the finger. We have also got the soft uh, ambassadors, so those guys, those folks are being um, very proactive in sending out the newsletters, uh, setting up finance days. Just in the past three years, we had two major events, which is 400 people hackathon um, for employees, which was very successful. And I can tell you that we, the feedback that we got from there um, was outstanding. Then we also had the Innovation Gala, where we celebrated all the robotics achievements in sort of an Oscars Gala um, manner as well. Uh, which was very, very well perceived um, by the employees as well. On top of that, we've got a lot of innovation briefings, so mails that are coming out with all the successes, with um, you know, just asking them to get engaged and to see past their current job how they can actually um, continue to you know, um, grow, grow themselves and deliver the best results to the customers. Um, so with that, quickly a little, about, a little bit about the lessons learned. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I'll just wrap up, um, just summarizing the lessons learned. Um, so the first one, get sponsorship and define strategy. So I think this, you know, our observation or my observation is that three years ago, we had a corporate controller who was sponsoring this, very strong advocate for innovation. And we also had support of uh, our CFO at the time. She also invested a bit of money um, into the program to help, you know, get us out into the other finance organizations and treasury and credit and collections to really change that mindset and get them on board with robotics process automation. Um, so from the top, I think it's really essential that you have that strong sponsorship to make a, and make a move in this space. Um, number two, augment workforce strategy and higher skills of the future. So, you know, this team is sitting within finance, but I think three-fourths of the team is probably statisticians, um, uh, coders, data analytics, sorry. 
coders, coders, yes, of course, um, and, and then some that are finance backgrounds that have since converted over into coding. Um, but we have really strong, uh, you know, data scientists um, as well. So then, as Carolina was mentioning, you know, really engaging the employees in building this culture, um, getting them excited about the changes that are coming and, re and recognize them for their, um, their support. And then, you know, again, one of the lessons learned, start small and build, and build uh, looking at the ROI. As I mentioned, in engaging IT early, using Lean Six Sigma, your black belts to help with the process um, standardization, and then, of course, uh, strong governance and controls. So just to quickly wrap up, since we're over time, maybe just the quick quote at the end. Uh, the best way to predict the future is to invent it. So I think, thank, thank you. you.